So it's a good news. It seems that you find your way for the room this morning. Thank you. Uh, just two or three points before we begin uh, this plenary session. First, uh, if you want to assist to the gala dinner tonight, we have few, very few uh, tickets. So you can go to the registration and buy it. So it, uh, in the Carlo just near and you will welcome. Second thing, during uh, the keynote uh, and after the keynote, you have the possibility to ask questions. So you, you will have the possibility to ask questions by the microphone, but also by question through our application. To do this, you go on application, you log in first, you go on your application and you click on plenary session. You have the three plenary session and you push the button for ask question in front of the second plenary session, which is a keynote speech. Like this, you can ask question even during the, the, the keynote book. And Mia will be there, will uh, join all your questions and make a wonderful synthesis. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Today, I have been asked to uh, introduce somebody who does not need any, an introduction. All I can do is affirm that all the good things you have heard is true. <laughs> She's a professor at uh, Brand Brandeis University. Uh, for a short while, uh, she has worked in different other different capacities. Uh, her work is on politics and public policy. Uh, the main work that she's well known globally is policy paradox. Uh, and for me, I have been reading that book for many years, but I'm, this is the first time I have met her. Thank you. And for many of you, it will probably be the same. Uh, and she's passionate about public policy. That's evident in her work and in the books uh, and inspired countless students and instill them in them a sense of inquiry, inquisitiveness, and a determination to change the world. And now, instead of me introducing more, I'll let yes. Professor Stones do the talking. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you, Ramesh. Brian, can we uh, get rid of this thing? <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, one of the fictions of academic life is that when we submit uh, conference proposals and titles, that we actually know what we're going to talk about several months later. Uh, obviously, I didn't. And so I had to change my title. But Ramesh, I have to tell you, if only I'd seen your welcome letter in the program booklet before yesterday, I would have stolen one of your phrases from my title, the political impossibilities of public policy. That's exactly what I'm gonna talk about. How did you know? <laughs> Our field was founded on a special relationship between science and democracy. To me, it's a noble vision, but I think it was problematic from the beginning, and now it's in serious trouble. Let me explain this by telling you a bit about my professional bio that isn't on my resume. I emerged from graduate school with a PhD in political science, never having had a single course in public policy. And suddenly I found myself birthed into this new field. I had done my dissertation on the German national health insurance system. I chose the topic because I wanted to help create universal health insurance in the United States. And I thought Germany's model was the most politically feasible one. I don't remember whether I even used the word policy in my dissertation. All I know is that I tried to make it as political science-y as possible. I made sure to put the word power in the title. Four universities invited me for job interviews, three of them in political science departments. 
After my job talk at each of those three, I was asked in all seriousness, what's political about healthcare? Why would a political scientist want to study medicine? Needless to say, I didn't get an offer from any of them. The fourth place I interviewed, Duke University, had just received foundation funding to create a public policy program. Since one of the three policy areas the program was going to cover was health policy, they thought I'd be a good fit. Besides, I was a woman. It was 1974, feminism was in full flower, and the new program needed one of us for show. I wasn't sure what this new field of public policy was exactly, but at least it had a name for what I cared about as a political scientist. Not wars, election campaigns, secret deals in smoke-filled rooms, nor any of the other ways people get power. I care about what elected leaders and officials do with their power once they have it. Once I learned the mission of this new field, I was all in. The mission simply stated was, I have to figure out a place to put my papers. The mission simply stated was to put science in the service of government. As I saw it, the notion of democracy was baked into the field's DNA. Specialized policy analysts would advise governments on the best way to solve whatever problems the voters had elected them to solve. What could be more inspiring than a field dedicated to fulfilling the promise of democracy? But I had a lot to learn about my idealism. In a nutshell, democracy isn't democracy, science isn't science, and money is the elephant in the room. The founders of the Duke program self-consciously named it the Institute of Policy Sciences, rather than public policy, like most of the other programs created at the time. They leaned hard on the word science and even made it plural because the traditional disciplinary departments considered policy soft. Some said the new institute faculty would be the policy Wallacey crowd. Using the word science in the title was a way of appropriating its cultural authority and symbolism to legitimate the new program. The program director hired a dozen newly minted PhDs and tasked us with inventing courses to teach students how to bring science to government. We had the kind of missionary zeal found in all social movements. And indeed, the field of public policy really was a social movement. We saw ourselves as societal healers. The faculty included mostly quantitative types, especially economists and decision theorists. They taught the students how to strip an issue of its social context, reduce it to a set of binary decisions, and find the one best policy option to achieve a goal. I was assigned to teach a core required course with a title I was given, The Politics of the Policymaking Process. It seemed doable until I realized I was supposed to teach the students how to get their ideal policy solutions through the political maze and implemented. In other words, I had to reconcile science and democracy. I was in trouble. I knew government didn't operate with anything like that kind of neat political machinery. I couldn't tell students to pull this lever and push that button and out would come their well-analyzed policy solution. I wormed my way out of the dilemma by creating the materials that became my textbook, Policy Paradox. It's not a how-to manual like the Duke faculty hoped for. It's more like a field guide to how real people manipulate ideas and frame issues to fight about the goals of government and to build support for their favored policies. Flash forward to 2017, almost 35 years after the first edition. I was expecting to revise the book again 
and had been savoring the revision as a journey of intellectual discovery, like every other revision had been. I even had a drawer for, full of articles and news clippings in folders labeled for each chapter. Then Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. He appointed cabinet members who openly aimed to destroy the departments they were meant to head. I thought and still think that Trump's election was a coup d'etat by non-military means. The more I thought about how to revise policy paradox, the more I realized how much I had always taken for granted. For example, that public officials are basically public spirited, even as they pursue narrower group interests. That public officials want government to work and that with rare exceptions, they respect the law. How could I simply rewrite the same book when none of these things was true? In hindsight, not only my book, but the entire public policy field was predicated on a stable system of democracy. Democracy wasn't perfect by any means, and social scientists were hard at work detailing its deficiencies. But I still think I and others like John Kingdon, Helen Ingram, Frank Baumgartner, Paul Pearson, and Jacob Hacker all believed we were revealing monkey wrenches in an essentially democratic machinery. We aimed to show people how to maneuver within these ridiculously complicated contraptions. In the last few years, I've come to believe that the essential idea of democracy is paradoxical and could never have worked the way it was supposed to. The mystery is how it held together for so long and is still holding together in so many places. Democracy's essence is popular sovereignty, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and Abraham Lincoln's famous slogan. The very notion of popular sovereignty assumes that there is such a beast as popular will and that it's possible to determine what it is. Nobody has ever really resolved those questions, but everyone seems to agree that elections can force popular will out into the open, like a magician can pull a rabbit from a hat. Election campaigns are supposed to let citizens tell candidates what their problems are and what solutions they want. Through a system of voting, the people choose leaders and give them a mandate. Then their leaders implement solutions to their problems. I'm oversimplifying, but you get the gist. Elections are also the mechanism for conferring legitimacy on public officials. In theory, participating in elections convinces citizens that their leaders are responsive to their wishes. But there's a wide gulf between what candidates promise in their campaigns and what they do once they take office. The ritual of elections closes that gap. Lighting up, marking ballots, depositing ballots in a box, and counting ballots. All these very physical and visible bodily motions do the psychological work of making people feel they've had a say. These periodic rituals dramatize the idea of popular sovereignty and make it believable. Elections are really staged dramas that enable the so-called willing suspension of disbelief. That's the process of self-delusion by which theatergoers pretend that what's happening on stage is real. You go to the polls, you cast your ballot, you watch the returns on TV, and poof, you feel yourself becoming part of the popular will. Unless your candidate loses. Then the magic breaks down. Political scientists call this the loser effect. Voters who supported losing candidates trust elections less than those who feel they've won. Compared to voters whose preferred candidates won an election, voters whose candidates lost are less convinced that government responds to their needs and they're less satisfied with democracy overall. The loser effect came to life for me when I read Barbara Kingsolver's novel, The Poisonwood Bible. 
The book is historical fiction about the Belgian Congo's transition to independence in 1960. A young Congolese man who's supposed to help run his village's first election expresses his doubts to one of the American missionaries. It seems odd that if one man gets 50 votes and the other gets 49, the first one wins altogether and the second one plum loses. That means almost half the people will be unhappy. And in a village that's left halfway unhappy, you haven't heard the end of it. There is sure to be trouble somewhere down the line. Leave it to a fiction writer to make us understand how strange democracy feels to people who haven't grown up with it. To quote King Solver, democracy is bound to lead to trouble and we haven't heard the end of it. We haven't heard the end of it because there are yet more contradictions lurking in the heart of democracy. For all the theater of elections, for all the stage sets we call polling stations, for all the people acting the part of honest clerks and monitors, and for all the citizens filing across the stage one by one to cast their ballots, behind all that drama, government officials choose their voters, not the other way around. Officials already in power choose their voters first and foremost by defining the rules of suffrage, who is eligible to vote. Short of making people ineligible to vote, officials can make it hard for them to vote. They can limit the number of polling stations and voting hours. They can run out of empty ballots and lose completed ballots. Uh, in the United States and a few other systems, they can draw electoral maps to ensure that their own party has the majority of supporters in almost every di district, a tactic called gerrymandering. US politicians probably exploit gerrymandering more than those in any other government that passes the smell test for democracy. In large part, this is because the US has a winner take all two party system. And in many states, incumbents have legal authority to redraw the boundaries of voting districts. But even if no other democracy is quite so riddled with these problems as the United States, I find the US situation particularly troubling. Historically, the US has had a reputation as a strong democracy and has been a model for other nations. The intensity of democratic corrosion in the US shines neon spotlights on the democracy paradox. Leaders in power control the process by which the people choose their future leaders. No wonder that even the most robust democracies can easily slip across the border into autocracy. Public officials are ordinary mortals. They're endowed with a full set of human flaws, greed, envy, bias, and selfishness, to name a few. So what ensures that they will make policies to solve the people's problems rather than become autocrats? Enter the idea of rule of law. It promises that even though rulers are ordinary mortals, once they take office, they will be beholden to higher principles and to serving the common good. They always put the law above themselves. At least that's the theory. The rule of law that is supposed to rescue democracy from its paradox is mired in its own paradox. On the one hand, laws are supposed to ensure that officials serve the people. On the other hand, officials write the laws. Those with power to write the laws can design them to their own advantage. They can also craft laws that in, increase their strength in future elections. They can craft laws that permit them to do whatever they want, say pollute water and air or replace residential neighborhoods with lucrative business parks. Once public officials have passed laws to serve their own purposes, they can merrily pursue their own self-interest against the broader public interest 
all while staying technically within the law because they wrote it. Then there's the problem of ambiguity. Laws are made, are, aren't made of barbed wire and cement. They're made of words, ambiguous words. Plato wrote that for laws to work perfectly, every man would need a legislator to sit at his side all through his life, prescribing for him the exact particulars of his duty. Obviously, we don't each have our personal legislator telling us at every moment how to comply with the law. So how do we make the rule of law real? Norms or informal rules are the second line of defense. Norms are unwritten codes of conduct that are common knowledge within a community. For the most part, they're widely accepted and obeyed. When someone steps out of line, others enforce the norm with punishment, ranging from shaming to ostracizing. Norms are invisible, impossible to see or document. Yet they're by far the strongest form of authority that holds society together. This is where the anthropologists and interpretive social scientists among us come in. You make the invisible knowable. You reveal the rules of thumb and the things people take for granted about how to behave and what's wrong and what's right. According to the authors of How Democracies Die, all successful democracies rely on norms even more than on laws. Perhaps the most important norm is mutual toleration or a shared belief that political opposition is legitimate. Opponents have a right to fight for their goals, so long as the goal isn't to permanently destroy the other side. Norms are the guardrails that prevent democracies from falling into civil war or dictatorship. Unfortunately, we don't usually notice how weak they've become until it's too late. Can science come to the rescue? The founding mission of our field was to, is to bring scientific knowledge to policymakers and persuade them to use it. How do we as social scientists fit into the democracy conundrum? In democratic theory, the will of the people is the sole source of legitimate authority for government. Popular sovereignty is almost a synonym for democracy, but science is altogether a different source of authority. It doesn't come from the people. It comes from a select few experts who have or claim to have superior knowledge about how to solve the people's problems. Insofar as we in our field do policy analysis as part of what we do, we claim this kind of non-democratic authority. Policy experts began trying to insert themselves into policymaking long before the 1960s and 70s, when our field took on its academic identity. From Plato's philosopher kings to today's policy analysts, experts have been claiming greater authority than the common people, pretty much from the get-go of political theory. Within this great span of history, I want to touch down in England in the year 1774. The election for representatives to parliament has just concluded. Edmund Burke, one of the winners from the town of Bristol, gives a most unusual victory speech to his constituents. Instead of mouthing the usual thank yous and promising to fulfill their wishes, here is what he said. Take a minute to read this and then I'll walk us through it step by step. Can you read it? Can you, can everybody see it? Raise your hand if you'd like me to read it. Oh, okay. Uh, first statement, it is a representative's duty to his constituents to sacrifice his repose, his pleasures, his satisfactions to theirs, and above all, to prefer their interests to his own. This first statement, is the version of democracy we all learned in school civics. And I started this talk with. Elected officials must not act to satisfy their own desires. Instead, they must carry out the will of the people. 
Next. But his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his enlightened conscience, he ought not to sacrifice to you, to any man, or to any set of men living. The second statement is where it gets interesting. Burke says he doesn't take his orders from the people who just elected him. He will follow instead his unbiased opinion, mature judgment, and enlightened conscience. These words I've highlighted are words of praise, congratulatory uh, testimonials to a person of high character. With these words, Burke puts himself above the people he represents and serves. In a way, it's a backhanded insult. I've got something you don't. Let me clarify that Burke isn't talking about himself here, but rather about his concept of a representative's role in general. He wrote this speech as a rejoinder to another fellow who'd also been elected as a representative to parliament. The other fellow said that a representative's own will should always be subservient to his constituent's will and his constituent's instructions. But clearly, Burke is talking about himself here and how he intends to carry out his job. This speech became one of the great statements about what representative democracy should mean. Going back now uh, to the third statement and the fourth statement, from where does Burke, uh, do, uh, does an elective representative like Burke get his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, and his enlightened conscience? Most definitely not from the voters and, the, and their wishes. Uh, he does not derive these from your pleasure, no, nor from the common law and the constitution or the constitution. His unbiased, mature, enlightened thoughts are a trust from providence, the last statement up there. I don't know what Burke meant by providence. He didn't say God or the divine, but he clearly meant that public officials should take their direction from some higher source than human beings. Perhaps Burke's providence is what we today would call truth. Edmund Burke's debate with his colleague is the same debate we know today as the wisdom of the crowd versus expertise. Lest you have any doubt which side he's on, hear this. If government were a matter of will upon any side, yours without question ought to be superior. But government and legislation are matters of reason and judgment and not of inclination. So much for popular will as the basis for democracy. <clears throat> Burke is generally considered a father of conservatism, but I'm more interested in him because he makes a compelling case for why expertise should override popular will. In Burke, we find legitimation for our field. That is, for those who see themselves, at least partly, as scientific policy analysts. Ironically, perhaps we also find in Burke seeds of the popular revolt against scientific expertise that exploded during the COVID pandemic. Because when Burke tells voters he hears Providence whispering objectivity, maturity, and enlightenment into his ears, the voters might well ask, where do you get off? Why should we believe you have a pipeline to Providence? Let's return to the present moment now and ask, how does modern science get its claims to legitimate authority within a democratic system of government? Where do scientists get off claiming they have a pipeline to the truth? I would argue that in modern times, the claim is based on two things, numbers, and the scientific method, or what I'd rather call the scientific mindset. It may surprise you that I put numbers first. That's because I'm frankly obsessed by them and their undeserved cultural authority, and because they're intricately, intricately connected with democracy and science. Democracy's connection to numbers is obvious. In democracies, we choose both governments and policies by counting. Uh, I'm not kidding. You probably can't read the caption. Um, 
and I'm going to show you. Uh, do we do we want uh, democracies? Do we want a democracy where every vote counts, or will we count every vote? This is the founding fathers of the U.S. designing the Constitution. The connection between science and uh, so. Uh, in, in democracies, we choose both governments and policies by counting. The connection between science and governments is a little less obvious, uh, at least with these two Buddhist uh, philosophers, thinkers, at least with math and physics, you can find the answer. The connection between science and numbers is a little less obvious. The scientific mindset boiled down to its essence rests on testing beliefs against empirical evidence. Scientists construct situations to test their theories and observe the results of their tests. But they don't merely look or watch as the word observe suggests. More often than not, they count how many times the results go one way and how many times the results go another way. They rely on numbers to tell them what their tests show. Scientific truth has become increasingly quantitative. So let's do some numbers before we return to the scientific mindset. Uh, the speaker at the podium is saying, tonight we're going to let the statistics speak for themselves. Numbers have an aura of extreme precision that makes them seem like bearers of truth. In the policy world, when government and funders demand hard evidence, they mean, show me the numbers. When people claim their policy proposals are evidence-based, they mean they have numbers to back them up. Numbers have become synonymous with hard data, with facts, with evidence. Numbers are considered more objective than words. They don't lie, despite what we've all heard about lies, damn lies, and statistics. But do numbers tell the truth? Do they speak for themselves, as the saying goes? Edward Corrin, the cartoonist here, uses a standard cartoonist trick. He starts the saying people use without thinking. The statistics speak for themselves. Then he draws a literal representation that reveals how absurd the saying is. Numbers can't walk up to the podium, much less speak, because they're creations of human imagination, just as surely as the numbers on stage in the cartoon were drawn by an artist. When we count, we have to make judgments about what counts as the thing we want to count. I can best explain this idea with a children's counting lesson. This picture is from the Sesame Street counting book, one, two, three, count with Elmo. Cookie Monster has six glasses of milk that are exactly the same size, so exactly the same, the same size, the same shape, same color. Cookie Monster's six cookies though, are not exactly the same. They're the same size and shape, but they each have a different kind of frosting. In case you're thinking, aren't you being ridiculously picky? What's the problem? Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine I've just baked these cookies and I invite six children to choose their favorite one and eat it. The first kid chooses the one with the chocolate dots. The second one chooses the one with the pink squiggles or perhaps the vanilla frosting and so on until the sixth child gets whichever one is left. Maybe that one on the lower right with a big blob of red stuff. He cries because he wanted one of the others. Does he think my cookie offer was fair? No way. He might argue with me. You said there were six cookies, but there weren't. There were two yummy things, three boring things, and one disgusting yucky thing. You shouldn't count them all the same because they're not. And this is why numbers aren't objective. They're filled through and through with individual judgment. These judgments have consequences. As my inner child just explained to you, this is why numbers are a matter of justice. There are several lessons hiding deep inside this counting book, 
Lessons that no one ever teaches children explicitly. Lesson one, the crucial fact about a number isn't how big or how small it is. The crucial fact is who counted, who decided what counts as the thing being counted. It matters whether kids or grownups decide what counts as a cookie. Lesson two, as any cookie loving kid can tell you, counting is a form of power. It's the power to decide what matters. Lesson three, things don't have to be exactly the same in order to count as the same. This is something we adults take for granted, so we don't even teach it to kids when we teach them to count. I made up my cookie story to imprint it in your brain. Lesson four, in order to be able to count, kids need to learn what things adults believe are the same and what things adults believe are different. Can you all read this cartoon? Probably not. Do you want me to read it? Raise your hand if. Okay. We, uh, so there's a white man and a black man in the cartoon and the black man is saying, we deny that race is a factor, but Obama is always referred to as a black man with a white mother never as a white man with a black father. What's that about? Whether we're talking about simple material things like cookies or complex abstract things like race, counting involves a lot of cultural baggage and personal judgment. I'm sorry, I skipped a little bit here. Uh, I showed this cartoon to my cousin. She didn't understand. What's the problem? Of course Obama's black, she said. Look at him. Would you say he's white? I had to think about that. Why didn't she think this cartoon raises any issues? My cousin looks at one feature of Obama, namely the color of his skin. From that, she sees clear, a clear answer how to categorize his race. The cartoonist, Charles Seiler, considers another feature of Obama, namely the races of his parents. From that, Seiler sees a puzzle. If race is biological, something derived from parental genes, which parent gives Obama his race? The cartoonist and I both see yet another feature that determines Obama's race. This one has nothing to do with Obama. It has to do with how other people perceive him and treat him. The rules for categorizing anything are cultural. They're made up by people and enforced by people. There's nothing objective about them. For me, this cartoon is not only about race. It's a powerful statement about counting because all counting depends on categorizing. Before you can tally up the numbers, you have to decide what counts and what doesn't. All the data we use to assess discrimination by race, ethnicity, and other demographic categories comes from counting account counts of population subgroups. But all the statistics on these topics are based on arbitrary cultural counting rules like the ones in Chuck Seiler's Obama cartoon. Until about 1960 in the US and much later in South Africa, governments counted race the same way my cousin did. Look at this person. Would you say he's black or white? Hmm. By the way, the person counting was usually a white government official. Whether we're talking about simple material things like cookies or complex abstract things like race, Counting involves a lot of cultural baggage and personal judgment. Since the scientific method depends so heavily on classifying and counting, all this ambiguity and variability poses a challenge for the ideal of scientific objectivity. Why then should we entrust our public policy decisions to science? Most contemporary philosophers of science agree that although total objectivity isn't possible, the essence of science is trying to approach it. Scientists have developed numerous ways to creep up on objectivity. 
maybe I should read this one. We should, why should we trust science? Because it doesn't trust itself. It's the title of a wonderful article. First and foremost, there's a concept of reproducibility and its cousin, reliability. Scientists test the value of other people's conclusions by replicating their work step by step and trying to get the same results. Reliability means that when different observers look at the same research material, they agree on how to classify and count things. If they don't agree at first, the lead researcher might provide more training and group discussion to nudge team members toward consensus. S Crucially, science is a collective enterprise. Individual scientists hatch their theories and do their research alone or in small groups. At the same time though, they share their research more widely by participating in conferences and scientific societies and submitting their work to more formal peer review. Naomi Oreskes argues that this collective nature of science helps it progress towards more objectivity or more accurate pictures of how the world works. However, if science is fundamentally consensual, as Oreskes and others say, isn't it just a glorified form of social conformity? You probably all know Hans Christian Andersen's fable about a hyper -con fashion conscious emperor. A pair of sly thieves tricked him into believing they could make him a splendid suit out of fabric so fine it was visible only to highly intelligent people. When the emperor paraded through the streets naked to show off his new finery, no one dared laugh or point out that he was stuck naked, lest they reveal their own stupidity. Everyone cheered because they were afraid to challenge power. Only a child who hadn't yet been acculturated to political norms dared speak the plain truth of what his senses told him. The moral of the story? Just because everyone agrees on what they see doesn't mean that what they think they see is the real thing. If everyone in the world agrees that Obama is black, does that make him black? All we can say with certainty is that everyone says they think he's black. We still don't understand what blackness is or means sociologically, psychologically, economically, or politically. In science, perfect reliability would mean that all observers agree 100% on how to classify and count what they observe. As a procedure for reaching truth, so-called reliability rests on the wisdom of the crowd. To be sure, in scientific research, that crowd is not a street mob. It's a highly selected group of trained researchers, of experts. Still, the procedures for creating reliability make them vulnerable to groupthink. The group's ways of seeing, the things it takes for granted, become the standard for objectivity. As in Hans Christian Andersen's tale, it takes either a lot of courage or a lot of innocence to disagree with the group. Naomi's Oreskes suggests how scientific communities can create the equivalent of innocent children. I'm using innocence here as a metaphor for two things. First, being impervious to assumptions that everyone else takes for granted. And second, trusting one's own senses and experiences over conventional wisdom. As long as scientific communities include scientists of diverse backgrounds and experiences, Oreski says, the process of questioning each other's assumptions and interpretations will counteract the blind spots and biases of individual members. In case bad or biased science, uh, bad or biased research slips through all the informal social mechanisms of science, peer review serves as the tough final gatekeeper, like the star soccer goalie who prevents all but the best shots from getting into the goal. For many people, it is this part of the science process that gives experts their claim to authority. Peer review, Oreski says, is what makes science science and not just a form of opinion. The idea is simple. 
No scientific claim can be considered legitimate until it has undergone critical, critical scrutiny by other experts. I highlight Oreski's characterization of science because it speaks to the dilemma that Edmund Burke posed for democratic theory. How should public officials decide policy questions? Should they follow popular will, the people's pleasures as Burke snarked, or should they base their policy decisions on the unbiased opinions, mature judgments, and enlightened knowledge of experts and scientists to slightly tweak Burke. I strongly support the idea that public policy should be guided by science, as I suspect most of you do too. After all, it's a fundamental premise of our field. Nevertheless, I'm troubled by claims for peer review as the last bastion of tough scrutiny. There's a squishiness to peer review that belies its tough image. The peer review process starts and ends with human judgment, and it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between judgment and opinion. Uh, the caption here says, your research is impressive, but you have too many original ideas to be credible. Most of you have had experience with peer review. Maybe you've been told that. You've no doubt noticed that reviewers often respond differently to the same manuscript. They're troubled by different things and suggest you eliminate or add different sections. When that happens, do you feel you've received an objective reading of your work or that there could be such a thing? Speaking for myself, when my work has been accepted for publication, I don't conclude that I pass some objective test. I know that I have benefited from a certain amount of luck in who the judges were. I know because I have a pile of rejections for the same work. Despite peer review, despite peer review's repute as a tough process, it has an in-group sense about it. Researchers submit their papers and grant proposals to places they think are going to be hospitable, not only to their research topics, but to their points of view and approaches and to, and, uh, to the, uh, their approaches to the topic. Editors and grant makers hand pick uh, scholars to perform peer review. They can potentially select reviewers who are likely to be favorably or unfavorably predisposed. I'm not saying peer review is always that manipulative, only that editors have a lot of room for discretion in choosing reviewers and in interpreting their reviews. Academic journals and professional societies are communities of like-minded people who more often than not have started a new journal or association out of frustration. Their work hasn't been taken seriously by the mainstream journals, or they've branched off into areas of inquiry that existing journals don't cover. They start a new journal to make a place for themselves and for the younger scholars they mentor. Their peer reviewing is going to be kinder and gentler, not necessarily less rigorous in terms of scientific standards, but less rigor mortis in terms of being alive to new topics and new ways of thinking. Here too, I speak from personal experience. As I said, early in my career, very few political scientists saw healthcare as something worth studying. At the annual meetings of the American Political Science Association, I found a handful of colleagues who shared my interest. We started a new journal called Journal of Health Politics, Policy and Law. We put ourselves on the editorial board. We reviewed each other's work. And as the numbers show, we had and still have a high acceptance rate compared to mainstream political science journals. Does this mean the scientific quality of our articles is somehow lower? I can't speak to whether we're getting closer to the truth, but I do think we've shined a light into some dark policy crevices and created a vast body of new policy understanding. Perhaps the highest praise we can give peer review is that it renders science a little more democratic, a little more responsive to popular will, albeit an elite popular will.
the only vote that really counts. I've talked for almost an hour without mentioning the elephant in the room. I talked about the two sources of authority that legitimize public decisions, popular will and expertise. I've talked about some of the internal contradictions within democratic theory and science. I couldn't have discussed any of these ideas with a straight face though, unless I put on blinders and pretended not to notice money. And this pretense is what I think is now the central dilemma of our field. Remember our field's founding mission to use science to improve democratic governance. In neither democratic theory nor the epistemic ideal of science does money figure as a legitimate source of authority. Democracy is not supposed to mean you pays your money and you get your policy. Science isn't supposed to mean you pays your money and you get your result, except that now both are true. When I say now, I don't mean that the power of the wealthy to manipulate public policy is something new. It isn't, it goes back forever. What is new is that we now have extraordinary documentation of exactly whose money is buying off science and democracy in the last half century and how. And probably the scale of money's power is far greater now than it has ever been. I'll start with science because by all contemporary accounts, the science for hire strategy pioneered the government for hire strategy. When the tobacco industry was threatened by strong scientific evidence that smoking causes cancer, it fought back by commissioning studies to cast doubts on the tobacco cancer link. This industry strategist didn't try to disprove the smoking cancer link with solid scientific research. They figured that to delay any regulatory action, they needed only demonstrate that the link hadn't yet been proven definitively. Then they mounted a public relations campaign to persuade smokers and the general public that smoking should be considered innocent until proven guilty, a brilliant frame. Besides massive advertising, they created fake grassroots uh, uh, smokers' rights groups to pressure policymakers who might be considering putting limits on selling cigarettes. The tobacco industry's doubt strategy became the playbook for numerous other industries whose products or production processes cause great harms. The playbook gave rise to a new product defense industry devoted to preventing government from regulating activities that are highly dangerous to people, but highly profitable for corporations. David Michaels, who headed the Occupational Safety and Health Administration under Obama, spent much of his tenure fighting the product defense industry so that his agency could simply do its job, protect safety and health. After stepping down from his government job, Michaels sort of reverse engineered the product defense industry's tactics to create what's amount, what amounts to a handbook for science saboteurs. It appears in a chapter of the Triumph of Doubt called Science for Sale. If Michaels were into irony, he might have called the chapter How to Exploit Standard Scientific Techniques to Undermine Science and Gum Up the Machinery of Government. I'll mention only one tactic from Michael's handbook here, peer review. Publication in a peer reviewed journal is supposed to be the mechanism that separates science from opinion. We know that academic peer review is not all as pure as scientists would like to believe, but in the product defense area, a new species of vanity journal has evolved. These journals are directly or indirectly subsidized by industry. The editorial boards are staffed by scientists with strong financial ties to the industries uh, they, uh, to, that they represent. Some of the editors and writers have even done product defense work themselves for lucrative fees. Typically, the editorial boards include a few scientists who are not industry consultants, just for a little bit of protective cover. 
The journals have innocuous scientific sounding names, such as regulatory toxicology and pharmacology. They are for all purposes, industry fronts to gain scientific credibility for their self-interested, politically motivated anti-science positions. Thanks to political economists, journalists, historians, and others, we know a lot more about how the product of defense industry served as the model for the super rich to gain control of government. About how money buys candidates for public office, buys elections, buys legislators, regulators, sometimes judges, and ultimately buys policies how money stymies law enforcement against wealthy corporations and oligarchs, how money buys public opinion and attitudes, how it buys intellectuals, teachers, experts, and research. And most importantly, we know how money shapes the dominant public narrative about the role of government and its relationship to business. Scholars have elaborated this public narrative under the rubric of neoliberalism, Neoliberalism is usually cast as a set of ideas about liberating free markets from government regulation, privatizing most government functions, and reducing taxes on the wealthy. But to see neoliberalism as a set of ideas is to miss the point. Neoliberalism is a system of governance in which money holds the power. As a set of ideas, it is simply the way the owners of capital justify their political domination by making it seem good for everybody. That is democratic. Jane Mayer's book, Dark Money, portrays a network of hype-rich corporate leaders who use their multi-millions and billions to bend American government to their own purposes, namely making more money by doing whatever they pleased, regardless of the consequences for the broad public, and, the, and regardless of the law. Meyer's book is about the US, but dark money is everywhere. Moreover, everything that American super wealthy corporate leaders did to reshape domestic political culture and policy spread outwards to transform governments and political culture in Europe and the rest of the world. More recently, the public narrative goes beyond economics to justify a nexus of far right ideas. These include white supremacy, Christian supremacy, ending immigration, subjugating women and LGBTQ people, and breaking up the European Union and any other international alliances that might try to regulate economic actors. In our field, we're fond of talking about the diffusion of innovation and the diffusion of knowledge. The diffusion metaphor masks what's most important. It masks agency. All that intellectual transformation didn't simply diffuse like gas molecules through the Earth's atmosphere. Big money pumped the ideas of the great intellectual transformation around the world. I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that the left also uses money to buy politicians and policies, but the scale is different by several orders of magnitude and the right is winning. Jane Mayer's Dark Money focuses on Charles and David Koch, two brothers who financed and orchestrated so much of the right wing rise to power in American and European politics. In the late 1980s, Charles Koch hatched a three-part plan to bend American government to his vision of public policy. One, create ideas. Two, convert ideas into policies. Three, market the ideas and policies to citizens and politicians. Koch's plan gives me the creeps because its broad outline sounds an awful lot like what I was supposed to teach my Duke University students and what our field aims to do, bend government to our vision of the best public policies. In phase one, the Kochs funded intellectuals to create, it, to create ideas that make the big money worldview appear as the best policy for everyone. They funded university research centers, teaching programs, and individual conservative professors. 
At law schools, they funded law and economics courses whose central tenet is that economic considerations should be paramount in resolving legal conflicts, not fairness. In phase two, the Kochs funded conservative think tanks to turn out academic style policy analysts and analyses. These an analyses were then reduced to short briefing memos a policymaker could read in, 10 minute, in the 10 minute cab ride from the Washington DC airport to Capitol office buildings. In phase three, the Cooks created fake grassroots citizen groups to pressure politicians to implement the policies, uh, 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 not to implement policies that they don't like. They frame, uh, they frame every government regulation as a matter of individual rights and freedoms. This frame persuades citizens that they have a stake in opposing whatever policy the super rich want to defeat. The Kochs also fund rallies and protests against laws they don't like, as they did to fight Obama's health care plan. These artificial protests, of course, make for great TV coverage, depicting strong grassroots opposition to the politician or policy in question. And of course, phase three involved a little bit of money too. Yes, I know this cartoon is a repeat. I'm just throwing my money around to make my point. In 1990, Coke Industries was convicted of defrauding the federal government by overstating amounts of oil it sold the government. At the same time, Coke Industries was sued for, grass, for gross violations of environmental protection and uh, occupational safety laws, though the Cokes escaped conviction on those. Later, Coke said that these events were a wake up call that galvanized him into public, uh, into political action. He wrote, we were caught unprepared by the rapid increase in regulation. While business was becoming increasingly regulated, we kept thinking and acting as if we lived in a pure market economy. When I read this quotation, as I was preparing this talk, I had an eerie sense that with a little tweaking, it should be our wake up call. While big business and the super rich were quietly taking over government and corrupting science, we kept thinking and acting as if we live in a democracy where popular will and scientific expertise are the primary basis of policy decisions. If the founding mission of our field was to bring science into government, we need to focus now on how to get money out of government and science. In hindsight, I wonder whether democracy and science were so vulnerable to hostile takeover by money because of the internal contradictions I've explored in this talk. Has democracy been vulnerable to money because democratic theory didn't have a good answer to the questions, what is popular will and how can we know what it is? Elections, interest groups and public opinion surveys are woefully inadequate tools for the task. These mechanisms each have their weaknesses and money exploited them. Money created sham popular will by manipulating public opinion and creating shell interest groups to speak money's interests to power. I wonder too, whether science was vulnerable to take over by money because measurement is one of science's critical tools and numbers aren't as free of assumptions and subjective judgments as we would like to believe. Nor is the social model for validating scientific claims as foolproof as scientists wish and sometimes pretend it to be. So now that we've talked about it, what are we going to do about getting money out of government and science? I'm honestly not sure whether our tools are up to the task. Short of matching the money wielded by the hyper-rich, unlikely, how do we seize back some of the political power they've already cornered? The best tool we have is issue framing. We've shown how advocates sometimes succeed when they redefine problems and reframe issues. 
We have developed good tools for reframing, especially causal stories and symbols. But the hyper-rich understand issue framing too, and they have immense fortunes to spend on crafting new frames and blasting them through schools and the media. Unlike us, us academics, they don't rely on spontaneous take up of their stories by policymakers. Instead, they pay big bucks to persuade citizens and policymakers to take up their ideas. I wonder whether some of the other tools we've developed are up to the task. I was teaching courses on policy analysis in a sustainable development program for international students. I asked them what problems were most important to them. Corruption was the hands down winner. I consulted colleagues and scoured the literature for tools they could use to fix it. What I found was either admissions of defeat, it's very difficult, or calls for greater transparency, improved management and uh, improved public management and political and economic reform. I wanted to tear my hair out. Yes, but how? I'll never forget one day when I had given students some materials on how to read statistics critically. A Cambodian student who had never before spoken in class raised her hand and whispered, if I questioned the government statistics, I'd be put in jail. One is supposed to end a talk like this with constructive suggestions and a big dose of hope. Taking a cue from Charles Koch, we need to reimagine how well our conceptual tools work in a world where democracy, rule of law, and scientific integrity cannot be taken for granted. Maybe we need to put ourselves in the shoes of people like my Cambodian student and design tools for them. As for hope, in our field, it comes most often in the form of a crisis that opens a window of opportunity for big change. I can't even offer you that hope because neither a global economic recession nor a global pandemic, nor devastating storms, wildfires, and floods. None of these genuine crises has opened any windows more than a tiny crack. I can only hope that I've galvanized you with a terrifying wake up call. Whatever else you're working on, make time to fight for science and democracy. Write and publish however you must to get your degree and keep your job and then write for real people. Go out and engage with real people. Hope is to be found in small places, in small projects with people you can actually hug. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Deborah. With a topic so broad and a speaker so insightful and engaging, we have a lot of questions. But I'm going to use my, the power of categorization <laughs> to categorize this audience into three. And I will take three questions from each category. And then we will keep going until we have, and okay. So here is one block. So I will pick three hands from this block, not this half of the block, I decide. <laughs> so, okay, there's one person in white shirt at the, towards the very end and one person in black shirt in the front. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I wish I knew everybody's name and I'll take one from around here. Uh, do I see? Okay, anyway, you, you still have time for. Hello? Much. Oh. Uh, my name is Justin Parkhurst. I'm at the Ellis. You didn't really speak about the role of the media in this. And there's been a huge pushback against media for just, for example, parroting politicians' lines, repeating what they say, versus actually taking an investigative position to 
show us if they serve the public interest or investigate whose interests are being seen. I'm wondering if you can comment a bit on that. Ah, yes, please. I know you raised your hand, but I'm going to, looking for a more diverse audience. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, uh, Mathieu Latarin from Humboldt University. Thank you for the talk. Um, a simple question that confused me a little bit by now that how one can differentiate between autocracy and a democracy with the metaphorical elephant that you talked about. So how could I differentiate yeah, yeah. between US being a democracy or an autocracy with the elephant in being in there? Thank you. Okay, wait for one more question from this side. Okay, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Raul Pacheco Vega. I'm a professor at Flex in Mexico. Um, and I'm also an interpretivist, just that that is very clear. And in your talk, which I absolutely loved, you spoke about science. And one of the issues with science has been reproducibility and replicability. And how would you convince people that interpretive studies can be also trusted as you know, quantitative studies? Again, it's just a question for those who are not amenable to interpretive studies. Thank you. Okay, so we'll let you answer these three questions and then we'll have another round. Great question, thank you. Um, uh, to your question in the media, um, there is a lot of pushback, but and I think there's also a lot of, uh, it, this is, the mic is on, right? Okay. Um, in fact, I'm gonna stand up a little bit. Um, uh, so a, a lot of the, there are, as I'm sure as I'm sure you know, there are media outlets and 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 um, newer ones, some online ones, some uh, not for profit uh, investigative journalism organizations that are doing exactly the kind of inquiry uh, that uh, that you suggested and that we, that we want. And um, the <clears throat> this is one of the things that. Um, that I think some more left-oriented philanthropists have given funding to to stimulate that because we need funding to counteract the you know the um, uh, uh, the right-wing media. Uh, the uh, the other thing that you, you didn't bring up, but I think is just a, a huge problem, is of course um, the the virtual media, the online media, and the ability of people to use media across national boundaries and in and, and cast stories and create public beliefs in nations not their own and uh, so to fiddle with uh, with politics there so um, it's tremendously important it's something uh, uh, we need more of how to distinguish between democracy and autocracy in a um, in a country like the US I I think um, to be quite honest, many people are saying that uh, uh, that the United States is no longer a democracy, and maybe never was. I mean, it certainly never lived up to the ideal of democracy, have disenfranchising and killing off of people that you know, weren't part of the uh, the elite. Uh, but um, so. But really, the, I, I can't answer your question. I'm, I'm not going to say come up with a, a fine line distinction. I think what your question raises is that we need more nuanced conceptual categories of types of government. Uh, the, that old Aristotelian, you know, three part category just doesn't work anymore. So, yeah, uh, good question. Um, interpretive studies. I think this has been the um, uh, you know I'm part of that uh, you know that group and I, I think this has been a bane of uh, of our existence. How to convince people that we're that we're uh, this is science scientific, and I hope that you take hope from what what I told you about the origins of the public policy field. That when we it first started as an academic discipline, the other disciplines were saying that's just soft. That's not real science like we are. So I think interpretive studies is um, because it has become legitimized. And honestly, I don't worry about it. I, for myself, when I did Policy Paradox, 
I couldn't have written that book until I had had tenure already. I knew it wouldn't be taken as scholarship by my, you know, my faculty. Um, but once I did, um, what what came back to me, and it was feedback from you all and people, you know, people who read the book, what came back to me that was that I was convincing to other people. People told me, you make me understand, now you help me understand the world I live in, the world I work in. Um, and if I can make people feel that what I've done has some truth to it, I'm happy. I don't need to be, put a, have a science crown put on my head. <laughs> Okay, so in from this category, uh, we can have three people. I saw a gentleman in the middle there. Uh, Thank you for your uh, enlightened presentation. I'm Ziggy from Michigan, and we just had a revolution there with elections, which kind of gives me hope that democracy can rise up again after 40 years of being repressed. This has gone, oh, I wanted to just point out that all of us can do one thing when we leave here. And th that one thing is unique to all of us. And we should think about that. What one thing can you take from her and everybody else when you go home and do it? Because I think what Stephanie and I have always imagined is that Thinkers think too much, and then they don't do anything. The action is something that falls away because they keep thinking. Stop thinking. Do it. And I think if everybody just did one thing, when we come back next year, I think it'd be interesting to see what those one things are. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hi there. Thank you for your wonderful uh, talk. Second. My name is Tamara Kravchenko from Uvic, Canada. My question is, in discussing left and right, what about the option of making the right more democratic um, and not just focusing on the left? Thanks. One more question there. Hi, thanks for this great talk. My name is Dieter Plewe from um, Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin for Sozialforschung. I was really pleased that you showed uh, the books that uh, like Jane Myers, Stark Money, and others um, that provide us with so much critical insight in exactly these uh, comprom the way science is compromised, the way is politics compromised. Why do these books not come from academic? sector writing what do we do wrong that such important books are basically not written by academics yeah please go ahead okay um um first of all um thank you to university of michigan um is that where you are are you just from the state of michigan are you from the university of Detroit. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. I, I, I love your phrase. Thinkers think too much, <laughs> um, and I, I totally agree. We're, as I said at the beginning, I think we are attracted to this field because it is about what governments do, not ethereal, you know, theory. So. Um, and that is, um, rather than give a list of concrete things that you can do, think up things in your own um, in your own sphere, in your own locales. But um, I think that's just wonderful advice, and um, it's maybe something to put on your to do list every morning, or your to think about every morning when you wake up. What am I going to do today, as opposed to talking about it or thinking about it. Uh, and if I have any complaints about academia, it's a it's a it's a wonderful career. It's just uh, I can't believe they pay me to you know think and write and you know talk. But if I have any complaints about it, it's that we think too much and we talk to each other and not enough to uh, you know to real people. Uh, how to make the right more democratic? Uh, 
again, I think um, people are people are trying in in every country and in every community to bring other voices besides the voices of, that are uh, money that are powered by money to it. And in in the United States, where the Republican Party, which represents the right, has been so totally captured by Trump supporters that even the people in Congress uh, uh, are afraid to uh, cross swords with, with Trump. Uh, it's really been very difficult to make the right more democratic, to bring forth uh, other candidates uh, in, in other places. But um, I don't have I don't have any answers to that question, but I think it's absolutely right that uh, people need to start uh, speaking to people on the right and drawing them a little bit more to the center, somehow framing issues that way. Uh, and uh, why have why haven't those books about science come from uh, uh, come from academia? That's a really good question, and it speaks to the um, uh, uh, Michigan to Michigan's uh, answer uh, question too. Uh, there, there's the field of science and technology studies, which has done a lot of this and has has, has done some of this, but not so much chased the money, uh, the money. And I think um, actually. Naomi Oreskes is an academic. She's at Harvard University in political science, but she has crossed that boundary and she wanted to be, she wrote that book, The, Tri um, the Doubt, what's the title of her book? Uh, doubt, anyway, she, she wrote her book as a trade book, meaning a commercial book. And it's not, it, it's not a bestseller book, but it's close to it for, uh, and she wrote it for a general audience with a strong narrative line with, um, you know, heroes and villains, uh, all the good elements of storytelling. And that's what we need to do, academics need to do. We need to do our research in the traditional scientific ways to be credible and to be honest, uh, but we need to then also translate our research uh, into compelling stories that will grab attention. Thanks. Uh, so from here, I see an energetic hand. Press, please. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for this lovely talk. My name is Anna Dornov. I'm from the University of Vienna. Hi. Thanks for laying out these binaries for us. And since you've asked to ask us to reflect or unpack our conceptual tools, and sadly, as public policy scholars, we should think twice about our conceptual tools with which we frame the problems. I'd like to pause on one of the binaries that you laid out, which is the peer review, without delving into details of that. I think that one framing that we should not forget about the peer review is that it has been set up as something against the science, me science metrics and bibliometric methods, as, as you said in the talk, uh, to highlight the personal evaluation of personal biographies. Now, I agree with you that a lot of things went wrong, to say it very quickly. At the same time... Uh, Excuse me, Anna, can you hold the mic a little bit away? Or say, I'm having trouble um, under understanding. This? I'm not this. sure what my problem this. is, but uh, I this? can hear you, but I'm having trouble... And uh, understanding. Is this better? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So was it, what I was saying was that the peer review was also, you know, developed as the opposite of the purely science metrics and bibliometric method. And of course, I agree with, you know, the lack of objectivity in our judgments and that we, everybody in this room has the stories that you've laid out in the talk. And now comes my conceptual tool question. Where is reflexivity in all that? And positionally, I mean, we have actually at the same time asked and ask ourselves how we can reframe the peer review. We have actually used that judgment process in order to, you know, learn things like a critical empathy, positionality, diversity. And a lot of the policy journals are now talking about inclusivity, diversity, uh, taking up uh, new forms of scholarship. So I guess my question is now very simple. Where is reflexivity? in that story of the talk. Thank you very much for that. Where is your 
what's the word? Where reflexivity. Reflexivity. Okay. Positionality. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay, first, thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening uh, to your talk. I've learned a lot, especially on your emphasis on the academics talking to the uh, real people. Not that we're not real, but you know. <laughs> so anyway, I'm from the Philippines and I'm very much interested also with uh, your emphasis on democracy and public policy thriving in, in democracy. So my question is, as a political scientist, like we're seeing the global trend now, it's like a reversal of democracy, right? So we may not be having dictatorship, but we have populist and autocratic uh, leaders we had that in the past administration uh, in the Philippines, and we now have the son of the former dictator. So my question is, are you seeing a so a reversal of democracy? So are you, are, are you seeing in the near future a new wave of democracy anytime soon or later? And then second would be in terms of our role uh, as, as uh, workers in the public policy field, um, would you be encouraging us to be more active in like promoting democrat democratic values where we're coming from? Because I know some of us might might be, you know, have different values, might be coming from different contexts, and even uh, academics, you know, can be victims of disinformation, and again, um, having different values. Uh, so those are my two questions. Thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Kevin Zapata from the University of Nottingham. Um, uh, I really enjoy your talk. But something comes uh, to my mind. It was about uh, the role of evidence. Normally in public policy, we like to believe that evidence drives the policy process. But now with the rise of the post-truth era and the intensive use of the politics of fears and emotions, it seems that evidence is just playing a very minor role. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. my question will be like, how to counterbalance that and how to promote a different narrative regarding evidence. Because what we just saw during the pandemic was quite discouraging and disappointing. Thank you. Okay, uh, the questions are getting harder and harder. <laughs> so, uh, Anna, on, um, what, what, what is your standpoint? What, what, is, what is any one of our standpoints when we have, all this thinking about um, identity, positionality, and so on. Uh, what I was getting at when I brought up the example of my Cambodian student is that, uh, forget all this stuff we've been talking about, about our different identities and uh, standpoints and so on. What if we put ourselves in the position of a powerless person who, whose ability to, uh, to say out loud what they think is constrained. That's, we, we, we exist, we've all come up through an educational system that values inquiry and values honesty and values truth. And that's the thing that we take for granted without thinking. And, now, and we, so we become aware now, well, we have to have sexual orientation as an identity or uh, uh, indigeneity as an identity. Uh, but I think the most fundamental position that we need to take is try to put ourselves in the position of someone who cannot speak truth to power. How do we gain, uh, and I don't know, I don't have the answer to this. I mean, that's why I was tearing my hair out. Um, but I think we need to rethink everything we're writing about, about issue framing, uh, about coalition building, rethink it from the point of view, what advice would you give to a person who is starting in Cambodia, to, who wants to influence public policy? Uh, the role of evidence, uh, let's say, oh, the new wave of democracy. Um, I'm very reluctant to make global predictions about, uh, you know, is democracy getting more frequent or stronger or being destroyed? Uh, it certainly feels like there's a wave of, uh, of um, backsliding of, of former democracies and um, 
uh, and the world is very much in flux, but uh, the fact that we're here talking about it is the thing that gives me hope. Do I see a new wave of democracy? Um, I I don't know. I can tell you that on some days I'm, I'm just dreadfully frightened about what's happening in the world. Um, and I just try to hang out with people who are equally frightened, but uh, together we support each other and try to uh, like this and and try to come up with ideas. Uh, the uh, the last question about um, evidence not being very convincing anymore. Um, this is uh, I know many of you in in this group have been thinking a lot about the role of emotion in policy decision making and in thinking about analyzing policy. Uh, and I think that is that is another one of the blind spots of the discipline of the field, I mean, of all social science disciplines, except those that uh, explicitly study, uh, study emotion. Uh, but um, there's been some, some really cool writing um, on, um, one of them is the, uh, well, I don't know, but anyway, about how the how brains process, how, how cognitive science and um, how important emotion is to the way we even make rational judgments, that our rational judgments are really colored by our emotions and people who, um, who lack capacity to have fear, for example, are unable to, because of brain damage, are unable to make good judgments because they can't weigh bad consequences. They can't perceive bad consequences and so on. Anyway, I think um, something that's really important in issue framing is how to appeal to emotions and appeal to positive emotions. We know a lot about appealing to the baser emotions uh, and frightening people. Uh, I think ap appealing, working on issue framing in ways that give people hope that call upon people's genuine altruism. People, everybody alive is alive and got to the age they got to because they had good caregiving for, by people who loved them, by people who, you know, who felt positively towards them. We all have some innate capacity to, um, to care and to, because we've been cared for and we know we, we value that. And I think that's one of the emotions that we need to build into uh, policy analyses to, uh, to strengthen where we wanna go. Okay, so we have seven minutes oh. and we have many questions that I've already made a commitment to, to start with the online questions. So okay, maybe I'll just do two. Sure. Um, okay, so one of the questions was, uh, should public policy continue to be um, in departments of political science, or does it make sense the, to see this trend of emerging uh, independent schools of public policy? Uh, another question was, um, if elections are supposed to decrease the gap between promises and concrete actions, given the limitations like gerrymandering and stuff like that, what are things that we can do to work within that context still to hold people accountable? And maybe I'll just put in that as well. Another question about um, things that scholars can do to encourage or lean into this idea of scholarship as activism. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> So there are there are many schools of and interdisciplinary programs of public policy, uh, and some start in different departments like uh, uh, um, political science. But I think um, it's happening. And and honestly, it, it uh, people take the initiative in one department or in a in a, a larger faculty, get some money, build a school. Uh, I would spend less time worrying about that than about what we're going to do, you know, tomorrow. Uh, I suppose I should be talking to the person who asked the question. <laughs> um, uh, what can we do in elections to hold people more accountable? One really important thing is investigative journalism. Find out where people got the money that got in their campaigns that got them into Congress, and then look at their voting record and what. Uh, what promises they might have given some really 
unnerving stuff has come out recently about Supreme Court justices in the United States uh, who were uh, uh, treated lavishly by uh, by rich people who then had cases before the Supreme Court decided by those judges. So that's probably the most important thing. Um, daylight, uh, bringing daylight onto. Um, uh, uh, and by the way, I was pretty distressed to see that I believe the EU, there was a judgment in the EU last week that um, um, that somehow said weakened financial trans transparency requirements and um, I don't know too much about that, but um, some of you maybe know that. Um, then the last question was scholarship, what to, uh, to activism was Same there. the second question. Follow yeah, it was, it was similar. How can, how, what are things that we can do to lean into this idea of scholarship? Oh, yeah. So, you know, one of the most important things I think is for senior people in the field to value active, activism and give credit for it. One of the biggest problems with the whole bibliometric system of evaluating the journal impact factor thing and needing to publish in peer reviewed journals is that to get accepted in peer reviewed journals, you can't write for real people. You have to write for people who only know that dense jargon. And then um, you, if you're trying to come up for tenure or whatever you, you so I think that public policy programs, if they, if the senior people, valued activism and some of you who are in that position now do it and make that part of evaluation of younger faculty coming up and then all faculty making that part of something that you teach your students to do ask them to have a piece at the end of everything they write about how does this translate into action into what specific things people can do thanks i think we are over time but please forgive me We'll give one very short question, please. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, Phil Cerny from the University of Manchester. I've been aware of many of the issues that you, that you spoke about uh, since I was an undergraduate in the 1960s studying political philosophy. Uh, the thing is that, that more recently, I've been wondering um, whether the background and the, and the structure of the issue has changed with what some people, including myself, by the way, call the dialectic of globalization and fragmentation. In other words, changes in the way the world world politics is structured oh that will take a long time to answer yeah <laughs> we'll have uh, very one very oh, we have the last one so tevara uh, you were taught the role of emotions how to build emotions that give hope that give life to people i was thinking about how to build what kind of approaches work is it the antagonistic approach or agonistic approach should we protest confront the present system or should we collaborate engage with the present system what works in the present scenario sorry but you have time on so these two big questions you have half a minute to answer okay uh, <laughs> maybe you can okay um a short answer to your question uh we have no choice but to collaborate with the present system to work with it that's what we've got uh and um as what as my friends say in the United States, they've got the guns. We can't, you know, stage a resistance, a rebellion. Um, the uh, and as to your question, I I think the same thing. The world has changed. The world you and I grew up in um, is no longer a world where even we can take nation states for granted. Uh, uh, policy happens and populations move across. They don't stay in nation states. So the whole uh, framework of, of the world that we grew up in doesn't, it's changed and we need to, we need to collaborate with it and work within it. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I myself have 10 questions. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> didn't and get a chance, I'm sorry. To, not move. Yeah. So very thanks, Deborah. Okay. Very thanks. Must end. Thanks again. So just before you leave, we need to do this award ceremony. So our vice president, previous vice president, who was in charge of the award, give you the name of people who receive awards. So please wait a few minutes that we have the time to give the award. Yeah, please. Uh... Let's celebrate some of the good works that our members have produced. Uh, hi, everybody. This is going to be very quick. 
Uh, I am Jose Luis Mendez from Mexico, and I had the honor and the pleasure to be the chair of the awards committee this year uh, to grant the awards in the different categories that, uh, that we have. I believe, of course, this is a very important task to recognize the achievements of the EPA members in the policy field. So I was, again, honored, and, and it was fun and a pleasure to, to chair this committee. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, very quickly the award committee. I'm not going to name them because yeah, time is short, but I, I would like to thank the award committee, the juries, of course, with the chair, yeah, the respective chairs of each um, of the jury and the members. And also this time we had a nomination committee who really was very helpful uh, to be able to uh, grant all the all the awards. And uh, next, well, I congratulate together with my colleagues uh, here, uh, all of the award recipients. And uh, we are going to hand in uh, the, the awards to the people who uh, were able to be here. Um, and then also I'm going to mention uh, the other two awards which were granted, but uh, the, the recipients couldn't be here. Uh, so first, um, the Early Career Research Award uh, was given to two uh, people, uh, Shiran uh, Victoria Shen, and Mahayan, I hope I pronounce it this right, Mahayan David Dewitz. So a big round of applause. Okay. okay. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, now um, uh, we are going to hand in the uh, award to uh, uh, the uh, colleague who was awarded the Transition and Developing Economies Award, who is Chahayan Buyan. Please. Congratulations. <laughs> and finally, well, uh, two of our, of our colleagues could not make it, uh, but of course we have to mention them. Uh, uh, the Career Award was granted to Brian Jones. So a big uh, round of applause to, to him. Who, is, is there. And the best book award was awarded to Akshay Mangla for the book Making Bureaucracy Works. Okay, well, uh, well, they, they couldn't come. Uh, first, uh, Brian, because he is chairing the this agenda uh, setting a research group, which is a very important group. Actually, one of the reasons he got the award is because he's, he has been chairing and promoting a research on agenda setting um, for, for a, a long time. And uh, uh, I don't know why. Uh, okay. actually, uh, Mainly uh, because they had other commitments before the awards were announced. So they can't really. Okay. Thanks so much for the brilliant job this committee did. <laughs> No, really, you know, they have put in so much, how many hours on this. So yeah, thanks Jose Luis. Yeah, and the t entire team. And there was a big team working on it. Yeah, thanks everybody. Now we go for coffee or tea.